My name is Shai Shalev Schwartz from Mobileye and I will, I will talk about the challenges of building safe autonomous vehicles. Self-driving systems are unique in the sense that we, are, we need to build a very, very sophisticated technology. Um, and at the same time, um, it must have an extremely high accuracy. So we have technologies that are very sophisticated like the smartphone that we are holding in our hand, but it has low accuracy requirements. On the other hand, we have uh, simple technologies like airplanes uh, that uh, achieves an extremely high accuracy requirements. But in autonomous vehicle, we need both a very sophisticated technology and at the same time, one that requires extremely high accuracy. How accurate? Um, so just a uh, back of the envelope uh, calculation, uh, humans in, uh, accident that involves uh, injury for human drivers happen approximately every 10,000 hours and uh, accidents that involve uh, fatalities uh, happens approximately every 1 million hours. So we need to aim for a bit more than that. So it means that the mean time between failures, MTBF for short, must be at least uh, 10 to the power of 7, meaning 10 million hours, and probably more. How can we achieve this level of accuracy? How can we validate the accuracy of the AV system? So uh, in order to tackle the, the problem of building a sophistic sophisticated technology with extremely high accuracy, uh, we look at uh, the sense, plan, and act methodology from robotics. Um, sensing is a perception of the environment. We need to build a, build a world model of the vehicle surrounding, understand where we are, what are the other road users around us, obstacles around us, traffic lights, etc. Planning is the decision-making part, and acting is the execution of the plan. So in the planning, we decide how to drive and acting is actually steering and braking and accelerating in order to implement the plan. Uh, most of the talk I will uh, devote to the sensing uh, problem, uh, but at the end, I will also briefly mention the planning part. Okay, so uh, how can we tackle the perception problem, the, the sensing problem. Our approach is uh, based on the concept, the simple concept of redundancy. Basically, we aim at building two fully independent subsystems. One is based on cameras alone. The other one is based on radars and lidars alone. Each one of them should reach and mean time between failure of 10,000 hours at least. And then if we take the worst case among the two, we can achieve uh, a very, very high safety standard. If the two systems are truly independent, then the MTBF of the combined system is roughly the product of the MTBF of the two individual systems. So now the challenge is to build a fully independent camera-based sensing system that can reach 10,000 uh, hours MTBF. Okay, so uh, what are the challenges of bu building a camera-based perception? The first challenge is uh, that uh, cameras are inherently a 2D sensor and we need a 3D understanding of the world. The second challenge is that we need an extremely high accuracy even in edge cases. So uh, to understand the first issue, uh, here is a, a video of, of a, a car uh, in a flood. Um, this was, you weren't supposed to see this, but let's see. So we see the car, it seems like a car in a flood, but then we see that it's a toy car uh, of a little kid. Uh, let's play with it. Um, so we see that cameras are really 2D sensors. There is no way to know uh, from the beginning of the video that this is a toy car 
uh, which is not uh, and not a real a real car so um, a camera as you probably know uh, this is a simple pinhole model um, we look in the image plane uh, two people we look exactly the same if they have proportional difference or a ratio of height and distance. The second problem uh, is uh, that uh, cameras depend on lighting conditions. So you can see here, uh, we have low sun. It, it's really hard to see what's going on. There can be rain, a fog, and all sorts of lighting conditions. In addition, there are problems of corner cases. So what's, what's in front of us? It's a tree uh, or it's a car. Uh, it's, a, it's a tree on a car or a house on a car. And on the other hand, you have here um, a truck and there is a house after the truck. It's not on the, on the truck. And it can be tricky to distinguish uh, between this truck and uh, this house and tree uh, that looks in the image space uh, at least close to the truck. So are they on the truck or not? Uh, there are also all sorts of uh, corner cases due to uh, strange looking cars. Okay, so these are the challenges. And now I will talk a little bit about how we mitigate these challenges. To convert from 2D to 3D, uh, we employ several uh, technologies. Uh, one technology is that if you understand objects dimensions, then object dimensions plus the image can uh, convert from 2D to 3D. Another technology is what we call a VIDAR, which is visual LIDAR, uh, which is based on stereo and structural for motion technologies, classical uh, technologies in computer vision that are now combined with deep learning technologies. And the third approach is maybe we don't even need a 3D model of the world. Maybe we can have something that can be extracted from images alone and uh, based on it, plan our decisions and control the car. So I will briefly touch the three methods. Um, 2D to 3D based on dimensions. So if you know that this uh, a person is two meter height, then you can uh, understand the range or how far it is uh, from the image plane. It uh, uh, solves the ambiguity that has uh, that the camera has. The VDAR technology is a combination of deep learning and stereo technology in order to estimate depths per pixel. So here is an example of a video that looks like uh, something that you can uh, obtain from a VIDAR or from a LIDAR, but it was obtained fully from cameras uh, by this uh, deep network that uh, manages to understand the depths of every pixel. Another related technology, which is a combination of uh, structure promotion uh, and uh, deep networks is a technology that tries to look at static uh, objects like the road surface and the uh, curves and understand the depths above the, uh, the road uh, plane in order to, again, to find the, to find the um, 3D from 2D. Um, the, the, the last uh, approach is maybe we don't even need uh, 3D information. Uh, so one of the approaches is that we have, uh, if, you, if we know our position on, on a high definition map, then we can project the map from the, 3D more, uh, from the 3D world onto the 2D image. This is easy because um, projecting from 3D to 2D is easy. The, the problem is lifting 2D to 3D. Uh, and then uh, you can work in the image plane while having information on the 3D world. So here you see a projection of a mobilized map, which is called REM, um, on the image plane. And once we have this projection, we also get 
we can also get a location of objects in the image on the map. And then we can work in map coordinates in order to plan our trajectory, tra trajectories. Last, uh, there are quantities that can be inferred fully from the image space without even knowing uh, the exact position in the 3D world. And in some sense, they are the important quantities in order to drive the car. One of them is what we call time to contact. The time to contact is the distance to an object over the relative velocity between uh, the ego car and the target car. Uh, and if you think about uh, the well-known uh, formula of uh, uh, time, time, velocity uh, equals distance, then you understand that this formula uh, tells us when we are going to hit the other car if the other car and we will continue at the same speed as currently. Now, a claim which can uh, be uh, proven uh, is that uh, the TTC can be calculated from the 2D image space alone without any conversion to the 3D world. So we can infer the time to contact fully from the 2D image. Uh, this gives us uh, a lot of power because now we can uh, take derivatives uh, of uh, things in the image space and infer quantities like the time to contact without even lifting to the 3D world. Therefore, we can plan a, a, a driving policy solely based on um, based on 2D information without even uh, needing to convert to 3D world. Okay, so this was the uh, first part about uh, uh, lifting 2D to 3D. Now the second part touches uh, ex uh, the need for extremely high accuracy even in edge cases. And here the idea is very similar to the true redundancy idea, but we don't have true redundancy because we are working with cameras alone. Still, there are many, many ways to solve the same problem. So even when we are talking about computer vision, uh, there is no single technology uh, which out, without any fault. Um, so the idea is to perform every task by multiple independent computer vision engines uh, of different, different uh, technology, and then to combine all of them in order to get to the requirements of the very high mean time it will fail us. Uh, for example, if we are talking about detection, detecting, for example, a car, then we can use the VDAR, we can use the wheels of the car, a, seg a full segmentation of the scene, uh, a, a dedicated technology for detecting cars, uh, another technology that is working on the full image and not on crops of the image, uh, another technology that looks at, at top view of the, uh, of the image, and so on and so forth. So, so if we build many different ways uh, to solve the same task and then we combine them, we get redundancy and then we can um, boost the accuracy of, uh, of our system. Same thing for uh, measurements, how to, how to uh, calculate the position in the 3D world and, uh, and uh, the velocity of objects. So here are some examples, uh, a system that detects uh, wheels, uh, a system that performs a full uh, scene segmentation. Um, so every pixel uh, in the image, and as you could see, uh, even when something is flying out of a truck, we can still understand that this is not a road and react accordingly. Um, you can uh, also have a pixel level uh, segmentation uh, to segment different objects into their semantic meaning. And therefore, once you segment them into their semantic meaning, you can track them and understand additional things like velocity and time to contact. Um, uh, this is an, another example. Um, so I think um, uh, my time is almost up. I will touch very, very briefly about the planning uh, part, the driving policy. Um, so as I mentioned, the first part is to understand the surrounding. The second part is to decide what to do next. 
Um, so the, the question is in this decision making, uh, and if we want safe decision making, what does it really mean? And one try is to avoid accidents at all costs. Uh, but if you think about it, it is impossible to drive if you are trying to uh, eliminate all type of accidents. For example, when you are driving in a typical uh, highway and you are surrounded by human-driven car and suddenly one of them swerve uh, toward you, then there is nothing you can do in order to avoid an accident. Uh, and, and the conclusion is that if you want to avoid accidents at all costs, you get a useless system, a system that cannot drive on a typical highway. Um, so, uh, so, so the, the thing is that uh, we need to uh, find the right uh, balance between a system which is useful and a system which is safe. And actually, balancing usefulness and safety is an ethical question all around society. And there, there are laws about them which are written for human beings, uh, but in order to uh, build a decision-making software for a robot, we need to formalize this ethical question and uh, to formalize what we call the duty of care, the obligation uh, to uh, apply some standard of reasonable care while performing any act that could foreseen harm others. So uh, we developed a, a model, a common sense model, that gives some mathematical interpretation of the duty of care. And I will not talk about it due to the lack of time. Um, and I would just uh, summarize that autonomous vehicle is a very challenging task since it is a sophisticated technology that at the same time requires an extremely high accuracy. And our two main components for tackling the challenge are first, redundancy. We try to build many, many systems for the same task at many, many high levels, both uh, a, a camera-only system and the LiDAR and radar-only system. And secondly, within the camera, using many different technologies, old and new technologies, in order to get redundancy. And the second part is uh, uh, formalizing what does it really mean to be safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shai. We have one question from the audience. This is from uh, Lee zelnik Mano. Uh, the redundancy approach is expensive in terms of computing resources. Do you think a multitask Multitask uh, learning could save computer for your scenario? Uh, I agree that the redundancy approach is uh, expensive uh, from compute, computation point of view. But if we're talking about uh, economically, uh, about the problem, then compute is not necessarily the uh, the most expensive part of, uh, of the system computes, computation power becomes uh, cheaper and cheaper over time. And while this is still a challenge, I don't think this is the largest uh, a challenge. Now, regarding uh, multitask, the problem with multitask is that you get a single point of failure. So if we are starting from, for example, if we are uh, talking about a, a deep network that starts with uh, something that does a heavy lifting jointly for all the tasks and then go to different tasks, then we have a single point of failure because if we are missing something in the, uh, in the beginning of, the, of this uh, monster network that later goes to different, uh, uh, to different heads, then uh, once we uh, missed something in the beginning of the, this deep network, uh, we are doomed. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a problem because you are in a game of uh, solving the corner cases. And depending on a single technology is always very, very risky. 